for the first time in four years, the eyes of the aviation industry turned to Langkawi, as one of Asia's biggest air shows returned with a bumper lineup of five national aerobatic teams. Welcome to Airshow Dispatches. Welcome back to Langkawi. After six years, Airshow Dispatches returns to this island to once again document Lima, one of the world's most unusual, dramatic and enigmatic airshows. Five national teams and some extraordinary action from the Malaysian Armed Forces. Let's take a look at what's coming up. We start with Lima's world-famous opening gambit, consisting of more than 30 jets, trainers, transports and helicopters then the Chinese and Emirati teams, back to Malaysia for the local flying display contributions, then three more national teams from Indonesia, Russia and Korea. It's also a bit of a surprise at the end, but we'll get there later, because it's time now for the opening gambit, an extraordinary display performed only once on the first day of the airshow. This display involves over 30 aircraft, as I said, and lasts just eight minutes. The action, therefore, comes thick and fast, especially in that first minute or so, making it a tough old display to film. But Nigel Woolley, who's filming this episode for us, doing a super job as always. trio of Hornets getting the action underway. bursts in very quick succession, comprising Hornets, Hawks and finally a pair of Su-30s. And now the two Su-30s plus a third reposition for a three-way opposition pass. Everything you've seen so far takes place in just about 90 seconds, so it's somewhat of a relief that the tempo now drops a little. Approaching from the front, one of four A400Ms operated by the Royal Malaysian Air Force, flanked by nearly half of their light training fleet, nine out of their 20 Pilatus PC-7 Mark IIs. As you'll have spotted, there are a great number of vantage points available lining both sides of the runway and on top of the hills opposite. And we see running in now from the far side of the runway, the trio of C-130H Hercules. Now it's the turn of the helicopters, two MD-530Gs from the Army and two EC-725 Caracals from the Air Force take centre stage. And while in the distance you can make out the rest of the aircraft lining up for the final mass fly past. So as 
the MD530Gs continue to operate low in front of the crowd, we see the main formation arriving in three separate waves. First, the helicopters, a Caracal leading two AW139s, flanked by a pair of Army A109s. Behind and above them, a second wave, the A400M, PC7s and C130s. Finally, the fighters, five Hawks, two Hornets and three Su-30s flying directly overhead and dumping flares while they do so, crossed by the other Hornet flying in opposition to them. the opening act of an air show. I would say the finest example of military air show choreography and showmanship in the world at the moment. Now though, time for something rather different. Opening our programme, it's the primary aerobatic team of the People's Liberation Army Air Force, August the 1st. Showing off their eclectic mix of smoke colours, the exact colour combinations often seem to change between each flight. saw Hawks the first, they were flying the J10AY Vigorous Dragon and its twin-seat version, the J10SY. They've recently upgraded, however, to the J10CY, a sub-variant that has been specifically designed for aerobatic team duties. It made its first flight only last year, and this is its first international airshow appearance. The key visual difference compared to the older model is the addition of a dorsal spine. This is something that has been fitted to several of the latest variants of the J-10, usually housing additional avionics or electronic warfare equipment though presumably not in this case. Major difference, these J-10 CYs have retained the Russian-designed AL-31F engine. All other J-10s to leave the factory in recent years have been fitted with more modern Chinese engines, but the AL-31 apparently has slightly less turbine lag, and that extra responsiveness is advantageous for formation aerobatics. J10 performs very well in roll. Here are some twinkle rolls to prove it. The 
manufacturer claims a maximum roll rate of 400 degrees per second. That would be extraordinary if true, and it's probably nothing like that fast in the real world. But still, 200 degrees per second just then, which is comparable to the F-16. It's very good. The F-16 analogy holds true in other ways as well. The J-10 is designed to operate in a comparable role. Its size and performance are roughly analogous, although it does have a smaller weapons payload. Loaded rolls there, a little bit of up elevator to create that corkscrewing motion. And now, as the soloist clears the airspace, the main formation arrives for their final manoeuvre, the Blossom. existed since the 1960s and they have appeared at Lima once before but they're still a very rare sight on the international air show circuit it's great to see them back Another very colourful contribution now, and another act that made its Lima debut in 2015, it's Fasan Al Emirat from the UAE, better known as Al Fasan. The name translates as Knights of the Emirates. They're a relatively young team established in 2010 with the help of the Frecce Tricolori. Nowadays, however, they are mentored by former members of the Patrouille de France. I must say I love the colour scheme. A striking mix of black and gold. Gold representing the sand of the desert and black representing the oil that was once found beneath. Not any more though, oil is no longer a particularly large part of the Emirati economy. Excellent smoke systems as well, perhaps the best of any aerobatic team globally. They're the only jet aerobatic team in the world to use black smoke, that's in addition to green, white and red. most challenging of the formation manoeuvres here, a loop in tango formation, very nicely executed with the front five aircraft sitting in line abreast. Now we prepare to start the much more dynamic second half of the show, the team pull up into a loop but twist through 90 degrees on the up line, that's known as a quarter clover and then as they come over the top, all seven aircraft split for the Alvazan Bomber.
by ex-Italian Air Force MB-339s purchased by the UAE specifically for aerobatic team duties. The MB-339 has no other role within the UAE Air Force. But these aircraft are soon due for replacement and will likely be succeeded by a new build Chinese product, the Hongdu L-15 Falcon, which is due to enter Emirati service sometime between 2025 and 2027. The L-15 will be a radical change for Alvazan, swapping from a very charismatic subsonic straight-wing trainer to a twin-engined, afterburning, delta-wing light fighter. It'll trigger quite a few changes to Alvazan's display, and certainly manoeuvres like this will no longer be possible. quite a common sight on the international stage nowadays. Their first public display was in 2011. They made their international debut in the UK the following year. They've in recent years displayed globally in Switzerland, Slovakia, Russia, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Azerbaijan and most recently Turkey. Just one more manoeuvre to go, and what you're about to see is not only Alvazan's most famous manoeuvre, but also one of the most recognisable pieces of modern airshow imagery. A very famous manoeuvre indeed, performed at state visits and sporting events of global significance, called the UAE DNA. Filling the sky with their national colours, that was the unmistakable finale of Fazan al Emirat. We'll take a break from the big formation teams now and look at the Malaysian contributions to the flying display. New for this year, a five-ship performance known as the Helicopter Tactical Display, featuring many of the rotary wing assets we saw in the opening gambit. Scenario sees a pair of MD 530Gs from the Malaysian Army performing close air support throughout the display. Malaysia operates six of these aircraft. It's a basic design that goes back to the 1960s, although the Malaysian fleet entered service in early 2022. This is therefore the type's airshow debut in Malaysian hands. While the MD 530s provide top cover, we see an EC-725 Caracal inserting troops via the fast roping method. Caracal is part of quite a large family of helicopters that includes the Cougar, Super Puma and Airbus H-225M. The first examples entered Malaysian service in 2012. They serve in a variety of roles including light transport and medical evacuation, but they're optimised for search and rescue. That means they're not very heavily armed, hence the need for close air support. The MD 530s are each armed with a machine gun and 70mm 7 shot rocket pods. The 
Israel is now demonstrating the extraction of troops. Solo displays next, and we start with the FA 18D Hornet. The RMAF has eight Hornets, all twin seat D models, and all part of number 18 squadron at Butterworth. The aircraft were delivered in the late 1990s and are due to remain in service until at least 2035. By that point, these airframes will be almost 40 years old. Some trademark Hornet pirouettes there. They fly this thing a bit like a mini Su-30. Notice, by the way, just one afterburner functioning throughout this performance, which is uh, pretty interesting. Not that it seems to have hampered the display too much. One potential solution to the aircraft's age could be to purchase second-hand C and D model jets from Kuwait, which are generally in a better condition than the Malaysian Hornets. No decision on that has been taken, but both sides are reportedly open to the idea. These aircraft may be old, but the flight control software has been upgraded over the years to yield some very impressive handling characteristics indeed. We saw earlier on some pirouettes. There aren't many Western fighters that can do that. And now, something even more extraordinary coming up, a manoeuvre I've certainly not seen from a Hornet before. Half a square loop to begin, that's another trademark Hornet manoeuvre, and then the jet rolls off the top for an abrupt pull in level flight. Kind of halfway to a Cobra, very impressive for a non-thrust vectoring aircraft. Good to see very liberal use of flares throughout the display as well. Always helps accentuate the manoeuvres. next a real crowd favourite, the Malaysian Su-30 solo display. And 
yes, officially it is pronounced SU-30 rather than SU-30. The SU is an abbreviation of the word Sukhoi, not an acronym. Specifically, this is the Malaysian export version of the Su-30, the MKM. Unlike the variants used in Russian service, which are fitted with predominantly Russian avionics, export variants are equipped with various Western systems of French laser targeting pod, head-up display and infrared navigation system, for example. It's also got integration with one Western weapon system, namely the Paveway laser-guided bomb. That's a capability that the standard Su-30 hasn't got. When it comes to rockets and missiles, it is compatible only with Russian products, which can be carried on 12 weapon stations in a basic configuration, or 14 with the aid of two multi-ejector racks. super manoeuvrable aircraft of course. Uniquely the Su-30 has got those distinctive canard four planes in addition to horizontal stabilators. Most aircraft just have one or the other. Plus of course it's got three-dimensional thrust vectoring with 32 degrees of deflection in the horizontal plane and 15 degrees of vertical deflection available. last episode at the Australian International Air Show, the F-22 flying a manoeuvre that its crew refer to as a Cobra. And I said at the time, it wasn't one. Well, stand by for the real thing. The Su-30 briefly flying at in excess of 90 degrees of alpha. Some say this is less useful in combat than what we saw from the F-22, and perhaps that's true, hopefully we never find out, but this isn't combat, this is a show, and the Sukhoi version is so much more visually impressive. <laughs> The Su-30 is by far the most modern and advanced combat aircraft in the RMAF's inventory. They operate 18 examples, all of which fly with No. 12 Squadron at Gonkadak in Malaysia's far northeast. They're relatively new airframes, delivered from 2007 to 2009, but despite that, the fleet has been plagued with problems due primarily to a lack of spare parts. At one point in 2018, only four out of those 18 Su-30s were actually in an airworthy condition. We saw a few minutes ago a Cobra, well coming up next we have a Cobra Stance. It's basically a less aggressive version of the Cobra at around 75 to 80 degrees of alpha, but it can be sustained indefinitely.
It's a little hard to tell from this angle, but the aircraft is maintaining more or less level flight throughout the manoeuvre, adjusting the control surfaces and the power settings in order to maintain altitude. A Lima regular now, the Jupiter aerobatic team from Indonesia. They've participated in some form in every single edition of Lima for the last 15 years or so. We saw in the previous episode of Airshow Dispatches the RAAF roulettes. Well, this display is in many ways quite similar, and with good reason. Jupiter Aerobatic Team in its current form was founded in 2008 as a four-ship team, but initially they weren't really capable of producing a dynamic display sequence befitting of the national team of the world's fourth most populous country, so they turned to the Australians for help. Between 2010 and 2011, the Jupiters and the Rolettes worked together very closely on improving the Indonesian team's performance through a series of exchange programs. The result is a reasonably entertaining six-ship sequence featuring a number of Rolettes-inspired manoeuvres. a new manoeuvre though, developed in the last couple of years. The soloists splitting away during this loop and the remaining aircraft diving back towards us for a split. perhaps most impressive about this team though is that they've managed to achieve all this with extremely limited resources. The Indonesian Air Force has 16 KT-1 Woombies, they account for the country's entire primary training fleet, and yet they are still able to field an aerobatic team and deploy near enough half their entire fleet to air shows several times a year. Another of these quarter clovers now into a vertical break, which serves as the finale of the Jupiter Aerobatic team's performance. Some additional Sukhoi action now, and it was a bit of a surprise to see this team at the show. They've flown the Su-27 for most of their existence, but in 2017 we saw the Russian Knights debut a new fleet of Su-30 SMs here at Lima. We covered that occasion on this channel. And now we see the international debut of their even newer Su-35S variant aircraft, a type they've operated for a couple of years now.
You'll notice that unlike the Su-30s, which these aircraft replace, there are no canards on the Su-35. Sukhoi decided that the penalty in weight was too large to justify, especially given thrust vectoring and modern flight control software is now so advanced that the aircraft can achieve the same level of manoeuvrability without those canards. Instead, there are now some extra antennae where the canards were once fitted. maneuverability I mentioned will come into play later on, but the bulk of their display is relatively simple. As you can see, uh, the team is crewed by full-time operational personnel who come together perhaps just a few days before an air show to practice an aerobatic routine. So they begin with this sequence of six ship formation passes, predominantly non-aerobatic, but there are a few loops here and there. So following a very lengthy sequence of six ship manoeuvring, the team begins to shed aircraft, reducing first to a four ship. The expended aircraft will now come in to land. Later they'll drop to two aircraft, then just one, with the display getting more impressive each time the team shrinks. These Sukhoi fighters are undeniably extremely manoeuvrable in pitch, plus they have excellent, albeit arguably not very useful, post-stall abilities, which looks great at air shows. But they are big and they are heavy, and that carries a penalty in sustained turn rate and in roll. And we're about to see the latter demonstrated, Two and a half seconds to complete that roll and compare that to the J-10s we saw earlier which completed an identical manoeuvre in a little over half the amount of time. The four-ship now decreases to two and they run in for a mirror pass. then split into a sequence of opposition manoeuvres. Position passes though are not the Russian knight's strong suit. The aim is to try and make it look like the two aircraft have hit each other. It's often known by pilots as the fudge. I've seen these guys probably do about 50 of these passes and in all that time they've only nailed it perhaps two or three times. I'm afraid it's another fairly big miss on this occasion. I should point out they don't make it easy for themselves. That was an extremely complicated run-in manoeuvre, both in terms of timing and lateral positioning. But now into a solo display of the highest quality. 
The Russian Knights may be Lima regulars, but let's be honest, this year they're here for one reason and one reason only, to cleanse the image of the Russian military and try to project a narrative that life goes on as normal. It's a narrative that is blatantly untrue, of course, because military air shows within Russia have been cancelled. At the moment, this team exists exclusively to perform for international audiences. reflecting the general state of chaos within the Russian military at the moment, there was some real will-they-won't-they they psychodrama in the days leading up to Lima. We were repeatedly warned in the days prior to the show that the team was literally minutes away from arriving, only for nothing to happen, and then we'd hear a few hours later that they'd either cancelled or been cancelled. This played out for about four days running until the team finally arrived the night before the air show started. There wasn't even time for the Russian Knights to perform a validation flight, which is normally mandatory for safety reasons. We have the end of the Russian Knights display and we're on to the final act of the show. It's the eight T-50s of the Black Eagles. This is a team that's historically been well known for not getting out and about very much. This is, astonishingly, the third consecutive episode of Airshow Dispatches to feature the Black Eagles. We saw them twice last year during the European leg of their world tour, then we saw them earlier this year at the Australian International Airshow. seeing here, as usual, one of the specialities of the Black Eagles transitioning rapidly between very tight and very wide formation shapes, probably the most complex series of formation changes of any aerobatic team in the world, these wide shapes being by far the most challenging to fly accurately. Black Eagles are here because the FA-50 is doing very well on the export market at the moment. Earlier this year, Malaysia placed an order for 18 of them. The follow-up order for a further 18 aircraft also expected in the medium-term future. The FA-50 ordered by Malaysia is not quite the same as the aircraft flown by the Black Eagles. These are T-50 jet trainers designed to train Korean pilots to fly the F-16. The 
FA-50 is no trainer. It's a pure combat aircraft. It has a cannon, seven weapon stations, radar, larger internal fuel tanks and tactical data link. The version that Malaysia will operate, the Block 20, will also have beyond visual range air-to-air -air capabilities, optional conformal fuel tanks and an air-to-air -air refueling probe. The other candidate in Malaysia's LCA competition was the Hindustan Aeronautics Tejas from India. So did Malaysia make the right choice? Well, probably. While the Tejas is a reasonably capable aircraft on paper, it is still an unproven platform. The programme has progressed far slower than expected over the past 20 years, and of those aircraft that have been delivered, quite a high percentage are either not fully combat capable or have been taken off duty for a variety of reasons, including factory defects in some cases. <laughs> The FA-50, meanwhile, is a proven platform operated by several of Malaysia's neighbours. It also shares the same engine and many of the same armaments as the F-18, which Malaysia already operates. If you are going to market a new combat aircraft, then what a great sales tool the Black Eagles are, completing their display now with the Victory Brake. That wraps up the last of the official flying displays, but there was one extra surprise. The celebration of the newfound alliance between Malaysian and Korean military aviation, with the Black Eagles joining Hawks, Hornets and Su-30s of the Royal Malaysian Air Force. Those special formations, which are always so enjoyable, wrap up our coverage of Lima 2023 as we move into our busiest ever release schedule for airshow dispatches. This is the first of five episodes coming to you over a roughly one month period, featuring airshows in Poland, Italy, and the UK. So make sure you're subscribed. Next time, Draken, Typhoon, Red Arrows. Yes, we're back at the wonderful Midlands Air Festival for the fifth consecutive time. Until then, thank you for joining us, and from me, Adam Landau, it's goodbye for now.